cut the activities of daily living as they become breathless. So in my book, with the amount of symptoms that Nagarjuna described, and the two exacerbations, one to two exacerbations a year, and given the fact that this patient is on Gina 5 management, the patient would be for biologics. Your thoughts? What do you think, Dr. Kandi? I think uh, based on the investigations they have done uh, and the history going back for 10 years, I think uh, this is a case to have to think of the, of the I think you have excluded all the complaints, head errands, other diagnoses, your rule of I think this case can be taken for a biologic. And one more point I would ask, the patient is having allergic lineage, so many atopic components. The treatment what uh, I have seen, that the patient is getting only mild to look us. Why? No, no, no. Uh, that was the treatment for asthma. She was, I have said she was already... Inter she was already... Okay. 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 So that was there. Yeah. So actually, you know, coming, moving forward, see, because this was in 2016, at that point of time, we didn't have any anti-IL5 biologics. The poly was not there, centrally was not there. The only option we had was Ohali. So that point of time, this point was also pointed out by Dr. Professor Emilio, the dosing. So if you calculate the dose of Ohali Zuma for the uh, 0 0.016 into serum IG into this, the, 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 the body weight, it would fall to around 600 milligram per month. So which is like 4 injections of Pomalizumab every month. So this was offered to her but however she said she cannot take 4 injections for financial reasons. So the only best thing we could do was uh, she, that, that exacerbation was controlled with the OCS taper, uh, switch to smart therapy with formidable bodicinate, continue triclopium. So the only option we had at that point of time. See we also have to work in the constraints which we have. So at that point of time, we only had Omari. We started Omari 300 milligram per month, not the full dose because of financial reasons. So next one year, she took Omari Zuma 300 milligram per month. So she was being tapered off OCS slowly over the next two months. These result symptoms became better, exacerbations, decrease, never stopped, quality of life improved. Again, the problems of finances come in. For every case which we deal with, and the, the patient had to stop Omari Zuma after one year. So exacerbations uh, in 2016, as I have said, one ICU exacerbation, one admission, three more uh, requiring the OCS. 2017, when she was on O'Malley, the exacerbations decreased. She had one one admission and two and two exacerbations requiring OCS. Uh, 2018 was better because she took almost one year uh, O'Malley at that point of time, and then uh, she was uh, off exacerbations. 2019, one year after stopping O'Malley Zuna. Again, she started having exacerbations. She had three exacerbations requiring steroids. 2020 was a disaster. She got COVID positive. She was admitted at that point of time. And that, that treated the balance completely. Since that time, she had multiple exacerbations again. Now, Dr. can I just stop you for a moment? I'll just get, uh, I think this is a very pertinent point. A challenge that all of us have faced, uh, Professor Abelio, where we had only one biologic at the time. I mean, the rest of the world did the same. And we were stuck to giving obanizumab at a suboptimal dose. We've done similar things in patients with ABPA, for instance. And there's sort of uh, 600 milligrams of obanizumab to patients who've got very high levels of Ig when the antifungal and the steroids have not worked in these individuals. So, any experience, uh, Professor Emilio, about using a lesser dose of anti-Ig in scenarios like the one Nagarjun has described? And the level of control, we can see 2018 was a great year for this lady, in spite of having a suboptimal dose. So your thoughts about the dosing here, and uh, how patients actually respond with what's deemed to be a suboptimal dose? Well, I don't have expertise uh, using a, a, a smaller dose. Uh, even though it's... Uh, so we had uh, Omadizumab available uh, in, in Brazil for 10 years uh, before any other biological was available. We got a good experience. Uh, and, the, and the way that we got the uh, biological was going to the justice. So we would present the case to a judge and because it was severe asthma, he, he would uh, advise to, to, to give uh, Omadizumab for the patient. And usually at the right dose, according to the weight. So I cannot uh, reason about using lesser dose. However, uh, the dose schedule about uh, omanizumab in severe endophilic asthma is some kind of, uh, uh, of, of uh, I would say, difficult to interpret in relation to the data that we have available. They calculate this about the, the, the IV dose in the serum. 
And uh, so I, I think that's uh, the, the first question. I think uh, response to omadizumab, uh, with 10 uh, years of practice, we have seen lots of patients that uh, did respond very well. Uh, we also had the experience with the progression of the use of losing effect in several patients. Uh, we never use in, in patients that were prednisone dependent because we thought that the data was insufficient to uh, grant uh, a sparing effect of prednisone. So we, we would uh, 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 choose patients. And uh, the second thing that we would do in our clinic here is only uh, we had sputum uh, measurements available, so we would use in someone that was allergic and eosinophilic. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. No, Dr. This is a common problem with us. Patients are eligible for biologics, but they can't afford. What do we do? So, um, did you consider using azithromycin in this group? We do. We do. We do. We do. We do. Uh, yeah. So, a fair point, I think, but uh, sort of in, uh, not in defense of Nagarjuna, but I think Patients who require biologics, GINA5, exacerbating, lots of symptom burden, the way they respond to a biologic, irrespective of which one you choose, is probably not the same as ethromycin. Ethromycin I use quite a lot, but I would use it that add-on treatment and maybe even use the biologic despite using the ethromycin. The interesting thing about the ethromycin data is why we use it in the polycellular neutrophilic group. It is the Amazes trial actually shows that it works across all groups, you know, all phenotypes of asthma. So. Um, yeah, so ma something to definitely consider. Let's go forward, Nagarjuna. Also, also, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, and the time said because only omalajimab is available, we have given the omalajimab. So we have also done the same thing. But the thing is that the dosage, the suboptimal dose, whether you want to treat or not to treat. If you want to treat, my, in my opinion, you have to give aspect, uh, that is obese lady, give me a suboptimal dose, and saying that there is enough data to say that suboptimal dose leads to more treatment failures than an optimal dose. So, no, so uh, don't completely agree, Nagarjuna. I think there is actually data which looks at a year's use of um, omalizumab and then a year down the line, halving the dose and looking at control. There's publications in India. There's publications which look at using alternate months of omalizumab and maintaining control over a period of time. I talked about the small observational studies in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis where you have IG in thousands where we have had good results using omalizumab and obviously a suboptimal dose. Now that the MEPO studies have come in with uh, uh, ABPA, probably we don't need to use omalizumab anymore. But I think there is a place of considering treatments like this and improvising when we have no other measures. So I am with you in this. So 2021, uh, after the COVID, 2020 COVID, nursing health asthma control worsened. So she started having monthly exacerbations. Every month she was getting OCS burst and her quality of life significantly worsened to a state that we had to start her on low dose maintenance oral corticosteroid. So she was requiring 10 milligram per day per for her to be, be under control. So, and uh, also she had another exacerbation following a viral URTA requiring admission. So this was in, again, so we had to do the phenotyping again in 2021, X-ray as you can see here. Uh, despite being on OCS, she had IG of 541, AC of 350, this is 10 milligram per day per decimal. Phenol of 40 and PAT was still showing obstruction. So moderate obstruction was still there despite using everything optimally. So in addition to the problems the disease post, we have socio-economic problems also in there, financial issues, no insurance, residents far away from the hospital. So this is where we are. So now what should be the next step? So, so Nagarjuna, let us take the opinion of the international and then we will come to what we would do with the second set of problems that you uh, described. So let me ask Professor Jackson. Professor Jackson, we've got, just go back to your phenotyping slide again, the, uh, the endotyping slide rather. Yeah. So, Professor Jackson, uh, we've got an IG, an absolute eosinophil count of pheno, and while we don't have a flow volume loop, we've got a report. So, the when you say moderate obstruction, do you remember percentage? 50%. It's almost, it's almost so, I think you want a 50% of predicted. So, your thoughts, Professor Jackson? Well, thank you. So, so clearly, it, assuming she's actually taking the prednisolone, I would 
always, when you do an example like this, if you have access to a cortisol and a serum penicillin measurement to do it, never assume the patient's actually adhering to treatment. I've, I've, we've made a mistake too many times, and actually it's not always the case, even if you think it is. Um, uh, because obviously, if you haven't seen a plan 350 despite 10 of the it's, it's a concern. Um, uh, but assuming she is adherent, let's just put that aside for a moment, then clearly she has very florid T2 inflammation, given this is despite 10 of pred. And an example like this, um, I, would, I would go for an MTR5 uh, therapy, and we would use benalizumab first line in this kind of patient. Um, we would use her over methylizumab because she's obese, uh, and we don't want to worry about the weight based issue. Uh, that mechanism doesn't offer, uh, and we, we publish data on that there might be a there's less of a likelihood of a really fantastic response in more obese patients. Um, but again, it's important to recognize with this patient whether you're likely to make her day to day symptoms a lot better or not. And the reason I say that is because there's lots of patients who are totally asymptomatic with a simple amount of 50 and you know, a 40 because they've got an FEV1 of 50%. They're obese and they're deconditioned. And fundamentally, what is really the key with this patient and the point I was making earlier is if you were to measure, often you would see this patient who's just as symptomatic and their symptoms are flat, phenol is 20, and the symptoms are purely coming from that obstructive spirometry. And in that kind of situation, it would be a total waste of time giving this patient biologic because the symptoms are not coming from teacher inflammation. Here it's different, and we would use benalizumab. As, as Dr. Milo said, I would never use omalizumab in a case where the patient is prednisolone dependent. The data behind that is very, very poor, and certainly nothing compared to the kind of data you see with methylizumab, benalizumab, and dupilumab uh, for this kind of patient. So, uh, just one further question, uh, Professor Jackson. You spoke about the obesity bit. Any other cause which helped you to differentiate between Benra and Mepo here? Any, any? sort of any factors aside from the obese, obesity part? Look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The, the reason mechanism and benedism work is by reducing the symptoms. That's why they work. Sure. So there's no and mechanism is every four weeks, benedism is every eight weeks. So I literally do not see the rationale for why anybody would choose mechanism over benedism if both are available and they're both equally priced. Um, you've shown data and uh, data where the, the Basically, the results, you're more likely to get a, a, an excellent result with be me better than MEPO. It's not saying that MEPO is not a good drug. It is a good drug. It's just, uh, I don't quite understand the rationale um, why you make someone take something every four weeks instead of every eight weeks, and why you potentially leave still half a cynical there, which would allow exacerbations in some patients um, when you can take them away with MEPO. So that's the only reason why we use MEPO in the rest of MEPO in this kind of patient. Thanks, Professor Jackson. So, quick point. So, Vishwanath, I'll come to you. What the microphone? So, quick uh, question. So, Indian perspective. Go to your next slide for us. Yeah. So, these are the issues with this particular patient. We see these patients on a daily basis. Um, what would you have done? What would be the What would be your management plan in this patient with the financial issues, lack of medical uh, insurance coverage, the residents far away from the hospital? So the first thing is obviously with lose, lose weight. Yeah, sorry. Sure. The most important thing. Rehab, lose weight. Maybe there's a that got spoken about. Sure. So lose weight. Wonderful. Lose weight, azithromycin. Uh, Sandeep, a uh, quick point. So we heard about this sort of complete depletion of eosinophils versus partial depletion. The good eosinophil, not so good eosinophil story. What's your take? You heard what Professor Jackson had to say, so your take about depleting eosinophils. As I said earlier, <coughs> the eosinophils are there for a reason. Uh, we need eosinophils for a variety of different physiological uh, responses. And therefore, to get rid of them completely, uh, or to believe that all eosinophils are bad, and therefore we need to, uh, we need to block them or reduce their levels to near, so near zero. May perhaps not be a very nice thing to do. Uh, at least from an Indian perspective, we need yes to from that reason, from, from, from parasites, from so many other reasons. Uh, but the other thing that I would do, uh, Raja, in this patient is obesity, I would look for anxiety, depression, stressful situations at home. These are very common causes sure. of uh, severe asthma. Uh, any, any potential triggers, I'm, I'm sure they would have worked it out. Fungal, fungus inside the house. Sure. That was, that was something usually mistaken. 
mosquito coil is other yeah. things. So something that I would certainly look into first before going into short sure. biology. Biologics, yeah. So uh, Nagarjuna was actually very comprehensive in the initial part, which you missed, and we sort of covered everything and went through all the points. But uh, so let's hear what you said. We probably yeah, need yeah, to move on. Sorry, can you just come in there? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I think fundamentally, if we assume this patient is adherent to the high dose ICS and the current embryograms of penicillin, then this patient has, there's no option but a biologic in this patient because you can't fake anything for count of 350 despite 10 milligrams of penicillin. Okay? So even if they have every other comorbidity under the sun, you know, like problems and obesity and anxiety, doesn't matter really because you've, uh, you've identified a patient that has T2 inflammation that is resistant not only to high dose ICS but to prednisolone. And this patient will continue to struggle unless you give them a biology. That's what, it's a really important point here. Um, the, uh, and so, you know, unless this patient gets on a biology, fundamentally they will be stuck on prednisolone um, in, 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 in my experience. Thank you so much, Jackson. Yes. Just one, one point I want to add. Severe asthma patients. So most of the cases are treated by the primary care physicians. Who is treating asthma is most important. And uh, uh, Sandeep Sarge mentioned what are all the triggers. And one more point to what we call it generally is vaccination. In this case, well, this patient is vaccinated or not. Again, it can be influenza and pneumococcal vaccine. Because 72 to 80 percent of the excess patients will be controlled by the vaccination. This is my clinical experience. And when, when we brand the severe asthma, so suppose a case is severe asthma for me, is the same for you also? This is the most important. A one physician cannot brand the asthma as a severe asthma. At least three, four consultations must be taken. Where exactly we are missing? Sure. Where exactly we are missing? This is the most important thing before we go to any biologics in our Indian scenario. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So in this particular patient, as Dr. Jackson has said, so she was a candidate for anti IE5 biologic, and uh, so we have two more cases. So I just we just quickly quickly finish it off. So. Uh, we, we, we could have chosen primary, yeah, but we didn't have yeah. any trial on primary at that point of time. So we ended up putting her on mepolizumab for OCS different asthma trials. So she started getting mepolizumab in this particular patient. So this is the first case. So just few take home messages are that uh, she, though she would fall an overlap phenotype, she is candidate for both. But as she is an OCS dependent lady with frequent exacerbations, probably an anti IRF biologic was chosen for her in the current scenario. I think with this, I'll finish the first case scenario. Lovely. Then we will start with the second case. May I make uh, just yeah, one yeah, you comment? Can, yeah, sure. Yes, please. Professor Sorry about that. Uh, I think there is uh, two, two, two uh, of the analogies here. But the first one is about uh, uh, azithromycin. Uh, the AMAZE study has shown that it works in the eosinophilic and non eosinophilic exacerbation. However, the amazing study did not uh, 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 determine the cause of exacerbations. And the most frequent cause of exacerbations in patients with asthma are non eosinophilic Okay? So, and uh, uh, from the data that we have uh, around the world, I think... You still can hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, from the data that we have, it's probably that uh, acetromycin only works in non eosinophilic exacerbation. So, the Peter uh, Kipsu study had a problem that he did not measure the cause of exacerbations. And if we took 100 exacerbations in patients with asthma, 60 are going to be non eosinophilic, so they are much more frequent than the eosinophilic one. And I think the second topic is about depletion or, or normalization of those endophils. Uh, there is this discussion about the mechanism of action, but if you want to look about data that has compared data from the biologists, 
network meta-analysis. And you look for all the uh, published network meta-analysis. You don't have any meta-analysis that has shown that Benhalizumab is superior to Mepolizumab. You have other types of data that Mepol is better than Benhalizumab, that you have data that they, uh, Resizumab is better than uh, uh, Benha. However, you don't have a single publication comparing randomized clinical trials in a network meta-analysis showing yeah. a, a higher benefit of Benhalizumab over Mepolizumab. Point well taken, Professor Amigo. I think we still, the jury is still out. We understand there are rationales and logic from both sides. So we understand that we're still in the grey zone as far as selection between the two biologic systems. And we'll go on Naga Jinnah, we'll otherwise I'll miss my flight. Sure. Yeah. So, so the second case is a 62-year-old lady, again a home maker, diagnosed case of asthma, again obese, 34.8 kg per meter square. Uh, she was symptomatic for 32 years. The age of onset of symptoms was 30 years. She has a lot of medical comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, hyperthyroid, all of them were well controlled. No history of secondhand smoke or biomass exposure in the past. Uh, symptoms uh, typical of an asthmatic, wheezing, breathlessness, cough, chest tightness, nocturnal symptoms, nocturnal awakening, expectoration. All of them were initially episodic and now she has persistent symptoms. Triggers what she has said but exposure to dust, exercise, viral illness, cold air exposure and strong smells. This is all she had. Uh, so just go back to the previous slide, Nagarjuna. So tell us a little bit more about the burden. Did these symptoms happen on a daily basis? Were they more seasonal? No, initially she had uh, seasonal symptoms. For the last couple of years, she had having daily symptoms. Okay. So even on her normal activities, like taking baths, she used to feel breathless. Okay. So now, so which was episodic, had sort of become perennial now, okay. the symptoms. Uh, comorbidities, just like the earlier lady, she had allergic rhinitis, well controlled internasal steroid spray, obesity, though she has been trying to reduce weight, she couldn't. She is OSA, AHA of 30, on regular CETA, good compliance, and on the CETA, AHA was less than 5 when she was using the OSA. She is anxious, she has a lot of anxiety uh, issues, and she, we have referred to a psychiatrist, counsel, initiated on SSRI, and now that part is taken care. Uh, as far as exposure to indoor pollutants, there was nothing as far as the history could uh, point out. No ongoing exposure to dust or triggers at the home. Exacerbations, two exacerbations in the last two years, uh, both of them requiring admission. One exacerbation required oxygen and she required steroids in both the exacerbations. So she was not sort of a very exacerbating lady but symptomatic lady, with more of symptoms. And the uh, treatment history, she was uh, uh, on uh, Nebulizers. So this particular lady, before she had come to us, she was switched to nebulized formulations. She was on ICS, lava and lava nebulizers, and TRA and oral methylsanthine. This is for the asthma. She was already on SSRIs, internasal steroids, GRT treatment for the comorbidities. On uh, examination, she had VZ, otherwise she was uh, normal, bilateral expiratory polyphonic V's. Uh, she had IG level of 90, international unit per ml, not very high. No no aerolegions which were found to be sensitized on the uh, specific IgE panel. Her uh, eosinophil cones were elevated to 360 and uh, uh, phenol was normal 5 parts per billion. Sputum eosinophilia is not there. So this is where we are, phenotyping asthma. The FE1, uh, FE1, as, as I had said, the lung function was less. FE1 was 44 percent predicted with not much of reversibility. So she sort of lost the reversibility when she had come to us. X-ray was showing hyperinflated lung fields. Uh, CT was showing some air trapping in the middle lobes, bronchial wall thickening, which was there in the middle lobe and the uh, uh, lower lobes, but no bronchitis per se. Family history, very strong family history. Her mother was a severe asthmatic towards the fag end of her life. She had received a management. She died of uh, type 2 respiratory failure. Four siblings have asthmatic asthma. Her elder sister, also a severe asthma, well controlled on Mercoli. Uh, the other two brothers also have mild asthma, well controlled on ICS lava inhalers, and this is their index case. So here we are. Uh, I think we should be quicker and take lesser questions because we have one more case to discuss. Sure, sure. So very quickly, I'll ask you something. Uh, I'm sure our international faculty will ask this question, so I'm preempting it. When this patient came to you, did you actually make an effort to change them from a nebulizer to an inhaler, 
or did we speak to an stick to an analyzer? What were the thoughts at the time? She was already on ICS uh, on, on inhaler and wave with ACEP because she was she continued to be symptomatic. So a physician who called referred to us had switched her to an analyzer so as to make sure that there are no technical issues in there. So so she was already on MDA before she was on analyzer. Sure. So we got someone who's got type 2 high eosinophilic asthma, I'll answer that question myself. And I will start with the Indian faculty and then go to the international this time. But can I have very brief answers please, rather than long ones, so brief answers. What would you do? Yeah, I would, uh, uh, there is no reversible pain that I feel is uh, smooth muscle muscle hypertrophy is there. So, she would be the candidate for branchial thermoplasty. So, one ticker for bronchial thermoplasty yesterday? First of all, uh, uh, I would uh, love to take off the SSRA and change into a newer antidepressant because SSRAs can cause bronchoconstriction through serotonin mediated pathways before yes. jumping into this. Right, so second point. But uh, Vijay, what would you go? I mean, let's uh, for a moment suppose that you've changed the SSRI to something which is more novel. Out of that drop down list that Nagaraj has given us, what would you use? Thermoplast. Thermoplast. So another data for thermoplasty, Sandy? So, uh, <coughs> SSRI, yes, there was one point I wanted to mention. Looks like uh, chronic asthma turning into COPD. Would like to add an uh, anticholinergic to see that works. Oops. <laughs> then I would think of uh, other things. Thank you. Sam. Yeah. Uh, as one sibling has already received a mepalizumab, uh, so I still go for uh, biologics anti IL Pfizer before uh, bronchial thermoplasty. That is. So okay. this is a real accident. We have to more than one option in front of us. Sure. So we have heard of bronchial thermoplasty. We've heard about anti IL-5 and there's this very interesting angle about a family history that's just coming. So let me take it to Professor Jackson first. Professor Jackson, your thoughts in this particular case and if you can be a little bit brief, please. Sure. So um, I think the key thing here is to appreciate this, again, what's the reason why she's symptomatic. He's clearly obese, you can see that on the CT alone, you need have a BMI. So from an FEV1 less than 50% predicted, which is irreversible. Okay? And this is there despite a PMO of 5. And what that tells you is that that obstruction is not secondary to inflammation, actually. Yes, you've got a cynical count, but there's lots of reasons why you can have a higher cynical count. You know, if you're cynical, you could be going to the nose or wherever else, you know, spondyloides, you know. But the, pop, the key thing here is the phenol is totally normal despite this obstruction. And in a patient like this, who has only had two exacerbations in a year, fundamentally the most important thing to do is to understand, is to try and phenotype that exacerbation. What is happening at the time of that exacerbation? Is it a genuine T2 exacerbation? Or actually, is it just a bacterial infection from someone who's got bad airflow obstruction, you know, bees who's likely to be underventilating their lung bases and is a sitting duck? for a bacterial infection, because actually if you capture them at the time of their so-called exacerbation, and it's, it might just be a bacterial infection, and the biology is a total waste of time and money for this kind of patient. Similarly, they may not need a macrolide every day of their life, you know. Uh, it might just be they have these two courses over the entire year, and most of the time they're okay, and actually their symptoms are due to their obesity and their fixed obstruction, which there's not much you can do about it apart from losing weight. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Jackson. Valid points. So, a quick comment, Nagarjuna, you know, about trying to exclude infection, active infection, when these, uh, this patient exacerbated in the context of this patient. So, she had exacerbated before she had come to us. So, that was the history of exacerbations uh, which she gave. As far as the history went, both of them are not associated with fever or virulence sputum or neutrophilia. So, this is the best I can tell, but at that exacerbation, sputum eosinophilia and all are not there because I think there is one study which was uh, mentioned in the next study where they tried to look at the eosinophilia during an exacerbation. Probably that is one way of doing it, but I don't think we have access to all those facilities. The only way we can uh, phenotype an exacerbation is to go by the clinical laboratory parameters. So, no fever, no purulent sputum, and uh, normal TNC during an exacerbation would point to a pure asthmatic exacerbation rather than an infective exacerbation. Sure. Thanks. 
strong. So we, I, I think here, to just want to very, very quickly, I think in this kind of case, I don't think there's a rush to start anything. Uh, you've got somebody who's not on maintenance penicillin, who for 50 weeks of the year is not on penicillin, and actually, you know, if there has been in your own clinic, if this is something to be referred from a non-specialist with a history of two exacerbations, I think there's time to ask the patient to contact you when they next exacerbate, to, to document that exacerbation, to do a phenol at the time, the blood symptoms at the time, CRP, you know, spend off some sputum, not, not for the cell differential, but just for bugs and so on, to truly really understand, because otherwise, we end up putting these patients on biologics or thermoplasty, which can, there's a risk factor, you know, macrolides, and it may, none of it may be necessary. So, Professor Jackson, a fair point about the exacerbation bit, but we're also discussing a patient who's got a lot of symptom burden at baseline. So, this patient is symptomatic on a day to day basis, but has course, daytime and nocturnal the, symptoms. The, the, the FEV1 is 46%. Anybody with an FEV1 of 46% is symptomatic on a daily basis, especially if they're obese. But the, what, the key question is not whether they're symptomatic, but whether those symptoms are going to respond to any asthma treatment, or whether they're just going to be there irrespective of any asthma treatment. Okay, so I'll just, I, I know we're probably running out of time, but I'll turn the question around. So, this patient is on maximum GINA5 treatment, maybe super maximum GINA5 treatment, large symptom burden, comes to us, comes to you with these symptoms that we've talked about. What do you do at this point of time, short of waiting for the next exacerbation? Well, the first thing, it, the key thing to, for the patient to explain to the patient is their symptoms may not be if, due to asthma in the conventional sense of inflammation. You give them a course of prednisolone and they don't feel any better. There's your answer already. No biologic is going to make a difference. You have to, you, you, you explain the importance of weight loss and getting, becoming more conditioned, more physically fit, just like you would with pulmonary rehabilitation, COPD. Those approaches are the same. But unfortunately, with a patient who has no reversibility at 46% FEV1, you need to explain that, unfortunately, we cannot make you, you know, asymptomatic. You will always feel symptoms because of this effort obstruction, which is now fixed. But what we can try and do is improve that level of um, symptom burden by weight loss, better conditioning, and if it's clear that you're experiencing exacerbations due to teaching inflammation, then absolutely, you know, there's biologics available that can stop that from happening. Uh, but I think it's very important to have a very open, realistic conversation with patients like this. Sure, fair part. We'll move on. Yeah, right? I think we'll move on. I think there's an excellent uh, point arisen. So the main point where why we had to choose an option was because of her symptoms. And both the exacerbations responded to oral corticosteroids. So there was definitely a OCS responsiveness, at least during the exacerbations. Uh, so at, the, at this point, as was debated, anti-IL-5 biologic was available with us and thermoplasty also was available with us. So we gave both the options uh, and we had a discussion with the person. So because basically she decided far away from our hospital, she decided to go for thermoplasty because it was difficult for her to come frequently to the hospital to get it. So at that point of time, uh, we actually we did a thermoplasty in her three sessions. Post third session, there was a mild exacerbation requiring admission for four days, but then she recovered well. Symptoms persisted, uh, but better. So she, she felt a little better after the last year. Three months down the lane, uh, she was uh, doing okay till three months. Again in May, she had an exacerbation requiring oral corticosteroids. She became better. So though she was some improvement, she was still not satisfied. And uh, other non pulmonary causes of dyspnea were ruled out, except obesity. Obesity, she has been trying, but then practical problem, she was not able to lose weight. So, obesity definitely remained a cause. Fixed obstruction is there. So, in this particular person uh, opted for BT, BT was safely done, but again, the patient was not satisfied. So, this is where we are. So, what would be the next step? Only thing I think left is the anti IL. Can you consider bariatric surgery for this disease? Bariatric surgery was also suggested, she refused blank. No, she, she was, um, we, we, had, we usually suggest a bariatric opinion for our refractory asthma patients with BMF more than 30, which was done in our index case also, but then they even refused to go to hear about the bariatric surgery. So, so that was where we were. Was there any improvement in FEV after the no, BT never uh, improves FEV, it's almost stable FEV. So this is this is where we were. So at this point of time, actually we had started her on Venerdesumab. So because eosinophil cord was 360, 
she took three doses in June to August, no adverse reactions, and unfortunately in September she had influenza A positive, again a major exacerbation occurring in admission, required 20 days of oral corticosteroid. So this is where we were. Actually, this is a long standing in the asthma developing fixed obstruction. The only positive thing was elevated eosinophils, rest all markets were uh, normal. And uh, did BT had exacerbation, started Benrally, again by influenza A exacerbation. And uh, this is where we are. So uh, the, the current plan is to continue on whatever we have. She's on all uh, ICS, Lava, Lama. Plan, plan to continue on 2 monthly Benralizumab and C. But, so if there's any comments or anything, we can just have one comment and then quickly we'll move to the third case for 10 minutes. Just one comment. Professor uh, Dimitri. I think when she had uh, 350 eosinophils and one steroid naive, I would give her a course of our steroids for 15 days to see if she has a, a, a prompton positive test. She would improve uh, airflow limitation and she would uh, decrease eosinophils in its circulation. That would give you an answer that she has a T2 high asthma. That's very important for the case because uh, I don't think that you mention any presence of variable airflow limitation in this patient here. <coughs> and I understand that did she have any variable airflow limitation that was more than 200 and more than 12 or 50%? We know So, because the, it, it was a long standing asthma, probably by the time she had come yeah. to us, she was probably behaving like a COPD, uh, this thing. She had a fixed airway obstruction. Probably 20 years yeah. behind the current zone, if we had done the PFT, we would have demonstrated obstruction in her. So, but the history clearly says that she had an episodic disease earlier, now uh, it's, a, it's a persistent disease. I think with this but I think the, a, a pharmacologic test in this patient here would be useful. I think that's a point to be considered, to give sure. a dose of OCS to see whether the person is improving. If it is improving, then it is considered to be a T2 uh, high phenotype. T2 high. Yeah, I, I, I think the point is well considered. So now coming to the uh, third case, 60-year-old uh, male, Hyderabad, teacher by profession, no addictions, non-smoker, non teetotaler, again obese, somehow all of our uh, cases are uh, <laughs> falling into BMI of more than 25 to 30, she is 33 kilogram per meter square, again hypertension. Uh, all are females. So this is me. <laughs> Uh, hypertension, diabetes, well controlled on, on therapy. He also has OSA proven on nocturnal CETA, good compliance and control. Uh, he has uh, a known case of asthma and allergic rhinosinusitis since childhood. Uh, he was, he, though he was not on regular therapy earlier, since the last 15 years, so from the age of 40 45, he has been on regular therapy and symptoms worsened over the last 13 years. So when, she, when he had come to us in 2019 December, he had progressively worsening breathlessness and productive cough, daily daytime nocturnal symptoms significantly affecting his sleep and quality of life. He was on five controller medicines, the standard ICS, Lava, Lama, Motilicast and Geophilin. Frequent exacerbations, two to three per year, admitted seven times for exacerbation between 2015 to 2019, none in ICU. Each exacerbation he would require, he was treated both with OCS and antibiotics. Required oxygen during some of the admissions, never needed an IV. PFT, we have the PFT here showing obstruction. Again, uh, this is un not reversible at the time when he had come to us. F E1 was 40%. Quality of life was poor, ACT 12, GINA 4, ACQ 4.8. All the basics were checked, complex assured, all the comorbidities all, all corrected properly, emotion stress is not there. Phenotyping, uh, this is this is a different case here. Ig was high high, 2024. Aspergillus specific Ig was positive, 16 KUA per liter. Eosinophil count was elevated, 330 cells. Phenol was normal. Sputum inflammatory was not there. Also sensitized to multiple allergens, including hostess mite, crash So in this particular patient, this is where we are. So what is the uh, also I also yes, CT. CT CT was showing bronchitis. Yeah, you can see nice bronchitis cystic in the right middle lobe. I think we will quickly have uh, KKK summary. 60 year old male with poly controlled asthma. So, at this point of time, we have diagnosed him as ABPA because he has elevated IgE, 
positive uh, specific IG to astrophysics fabricators, CT version of rocket test is long standing as the no frequent exacerbations. Poor lung function, poor quality of life, despite using five controller medicines, comorbidities all were addressed. So, what would be the next step to optimize her control? This is just to give the options, it is not that we would choose any one of them. So, we have a case of ADPA here. So, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the common problems we see. It's just that we, we don't diagnose a lot of ADPAs because we don't look for ADPA. So, how would you proceed? So, Dr. Kant, we'll start with you. Your, your thoughts. I think I'll go for the steroids and antifungals first. Okay. Yeah. So, steroids and antifungals first up. I think. Most people would actually agree with that, uh, Nagarjuna. So let's yeah. uh, move forward a bit. So in this particular patient, because initially we thought ABPA was the reason why her asthma was uncontrolled over the last several years. So and then we he we started him on three months of oral corticosteroids, steroid doses, and oral metoclonazole 400 milligram per day. The problems: sugar control significantly deteriorated during the therapy. He had started developing early Cushing guard features. But her, his IG levels came down from somewhere around 2400 to 1050, so 50% reduction IG levels. Asthma control, despite ABPA parameters becoming better, asthma control remained poor, ACT was still 10. Another exacerbation in May 2020, during the exacerbation we did an IG to look whether it was an ABPA exacerbation or an asthma exacerbation. There was no elevation in IG during the exacerbation. Uh, offered OCS uh, post exacerbation again because he was still not better. However, the patient refused because he was worried that he might develop complications because of hyperglycemia. So, this was a case where patient had ABPA given a three months course of uh, antifungal and oral steroids, developed steroid complications, and asthma control remained poor. So, now what would you do? This is where we are. So, this is an out of the box situation where you have a steroid. Uh, dependent ABPA or from steroid refractory ABPA. So, BT is definitely not there because he has bronchitis, so we won't talk about BT at all. So, now would you consider a biologic in this particular patient or uh, how, 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 how to proceed? Sure. So, I think with, uh, Vishwanath has a point. So, Vishwanath uh, uh, I have to make a comment on this actually. The steroids and nitroconazole were given together actually. Uh, generally, it's preferable to avoid a combination of steroids and nitroconazole. reason being uh, as you know, etoconazole is a side 3 or 4 inhibitor. So it, it is only methyl prednisolone etoconazole, not prednisolone etoconazole. So we have, we have done this publication also. It is the interaction between methyl prednisolone etoconazole. But I think not for prednisolone etoconazole. Sure, okay. I remember that it was in. Uh, no, this is one we have published also. Okay. So that is one thing. That is the reason why I think. Sure. But uh, fair point, Vishwanath. I think there's a lot of people who would start just with steroids and then add on the antifungal later on. There's both schools of thought and there's evidence either way. I mean, uh, I'm sure Nagarjuna will show us two papers at least that I can think of where both started together have good results. There's also add on antifungals later on, which has been looked at in the past. So you could argue both. And ways. also we can consider polyclonazole. I'm not sure because then there is a later evidence which is coming in favor of polyclonazole sure. as an upfront therapy for yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so any anything, any thoughts about, we'll come to the international faculty in a minute, but anything, anyone in the room has any thoughts about which uh, map, if at all, of the steroid sparing agent? Okay. Yeah. So the only thing to say is that umalizumab here is probably significantly raised for other mechanisms and you have the same challenge here is to dose the patient. You know, with a IG of more than 1,000 or more than 2,000, it's going to be a challenge to dose the patient here. So, uh, uh, Professor Emilio, thoughts? Well, to my knowledge, none of the, the biologicals that we have here that act on uh, IL-5 mechanism, they have been approved to be used in EBPA. So, if uh, you would think something about that would be on uh, off-label practice. Sure. Anything, any uh, statement about this case, uh, Professor Jackson? So I think the first thing to remember in this case, and, and I actually wouldn't have gone with steroids or azoles, because there's a few things that are unanswered. I think it's really important to look at those bloods at the beginning, because they tell you something really important about those investigations. What it tells you is, in the absence of steroid prednisone at the time, the acetylcholine was only 330. The 
fever is normal at 80. So yes, the, the bloods are consistent and the CT is consistent with possibly an ADPA picture, but actually the, the level of active T2 inflammation is low. Normal FEMO is in found only 330. Normally an ADP, active ADP, having a cinema count well over 1,000 uh, frequently. So this tells you something very important, which is that actually giving somebody penicillin like this isn't necessarily going to make any difference at all, and that's why it didn't make a big difference, and why he was still symptomatic. Um, it was never going to really make a huge difference. But what you really want to know is what are the symptoms in these exacerbations? Because only, again, it's only one, to, uh, two to three. Is what are they due to in this situation? The patient's got very bad bronchiectasis. Is it a genuine T2 inflammation uh, exacerbation at the time? Is it fungal related? Because here, what you need is the persistence to tell you that about fungal load in the lung. Uh, not simply about whether they're sensitized to fungus. So the specific ID is told yes, they're sensitized to aspergillus. But just like being sensitized to the pollen or whatever, it doesn't matter unless you've got a high burden of that pollen. So what is the perception? It's to give you an idea about fungal burden. And then number three, with that level of bronchiectasis, actually is it a bacterial event that's happening that's just driving uh, a symptom? But also, again, this patient put an FEV on of uh, 40%. Uh, so there's more than enough reason why the patient is symptomatic. So the biologic may not be necessary at all. It may not, I mean, what you've demonstrated, even, you can even, even before you get into the NISA, you show the level of active tissue inflammation is relatively low. Now, the IgE is not a marker of active tissue inflammation. The phenome is relatively low. Well. So number one, you've shown that. Number two, you gave the patient huge amounts of penicillin, okay, despite, you know, with diabetes and everything else, which can cause significant side effects, and yet they haven't improved which confirms the <coughs> point I made about the teaching biomarkers. Um, so what that now tells you is that a biologic is not going to make any difference. If they don't respond to penicillin at that kind of dose, a biologic will not make any difference at all. Then even if, let, let's take that aside um, for a moment, the IgE is over 2,000, they're very patients so obese, you can't dose and bottomalism out anyway. We've published data on MEPO and Benra, um, with very good results with SACs, you know, severe asthma fungal sensitization, and ABPA, getting very good results actually in the presence of active teacher inflammation. In, 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 in both methylismab and bemolismab was, was a combined cohort. We published that in Jackie in practice uh, earlier this year. Steroid experimentation, I'm not trying to say it's, all that's going to do is, is damage the patient, um, harm the patient. There's no, there's no biologic reason why that would make any difference whatsoever because steroid hasn't made a difference. So why would you do steroid experimentation? You just need to Stop poisoning the patient with drugs that don't work. That's the absolute key point here, I think. I think all the points were well taken. Uh, the, the problem uh, here is that we are just presenting the inflammatory counts at one point of time. So this person also had a lot of earlier reports where he had eosinophilia of more than 1000. And as Dr. Jackson has said, not all of, it, all of his exacerbations were predominantly inflammatory. He also had infected exacerbation because of bronchiectasis. So in this particular person, Omarizuka, we couldn't give, uh, nothing was there. So he was already on every medicine. So the only thing we had was Nepoli at that point of time. This was an off-label indication. As uh, Professor Emilio was saying, it was not an approved indication. But he received eight doses and he still on Nepolizumab. And uh, he had significantly improved quality of life after Mepoli. This is what the, the reports after Mepoli. IG level remained high. Usme field count came down further. And the quality of life improved and he stopped having exacerbations in the last eight months. I think for paucity of time, we would like to profusely thank both the international speakers for giving valuable insights into all the cases. It was, I think, a wonderful discussion. A thought provoking discussion is on a real life case scenario. So we don't, it, the, the real life cases don't come like a textbook case of a lucinophilic asthma or metopic asthma. So all the three cases were not altered in any way. These are all the three live uh, real life cases which we had. Practical problems, practical decision making, each person will have option, uh, will, will fulfill the criteria for more than one biology. I think with this we will uh, end the case discussion. I hope it was a lively this thing. And, uh, it's I can just raise one point, and maybe perhaps Professor Jackson could answer this. Obesity associated yeah. severe asthma. Yes. In itself is a this is a different phenotype. I think one last uh, comment by Dr. Jackson, because I think there, there was one uh, one point in your presentation where you were talking about obesity being a better responder to. Than yeah. I think I think that that point was also yeah. made. Okay. Professor Jackson. Uh, 
obesity associated asthma and biologics obesity associated asthma and biologics I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it obesity related asthma I'll just that there are some patients with severe asthma that are obese um, and what the data that you know when we did a patient analysis and we looked at factors associated with uh, being a super responder to methylizumab there was an inverse relationship with, with BMI um, so there some factors that patients if they had it they were really super responder to methylizumab uh, but a high BMI would be opposite so they were, they were less likely to be and I think it probably relates to a, to a dosing issue and that's why with methylizumab when we first started using that in some of their obese patients they actually had a better response and better methylizumab subsequently um, so just because a patient is obese doesn't mean they have monosynophilic acid. Clearly, obese patients are very symptomatic, and it's important to recognize whether those symptoms are simply due to just being overweight or actually due to the other classical elements of tissue inflammation. So that was the only point I really made about that. I would like to thank all the panelists for an engaging discussion. Now we'll move on to the next session, which is on bronchothermoplasty which is the only intervention option available for the treatment of severe asthma. Uh, to chair this session, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Gangadhar Reddy, sir, and Dr. Vishweshwaran, sir. Dr. Gangadhar Reddy, sir, is a senior consultant intervention pulmonologist, Department of Pulmonary Medicine at Ashoda Hospital, Sikandarabad. He is former assistant professor, Uspanya Medical College, professor, MNR Medical College, member of various societies, his areas of interest include pleural diseases, thoracoscopy, and refractory asthma and advanced therapy. Dr. Vishweshwar is a consultant intervention pulmonologist at Yashoda Hospital in Malakpet. He completed his DM pulmonary critical care from Sadarjang Hospital in New Delhi. He is in his fellowship of intervention pulmonology from Malaysia. Fifteen publications including review articles on original research and national and international journals. He is reviewing respiratory medicine, PubMed Index Journal, Lung India. I would also like to welcome Dr. Bhaskar Kakarla, sir, on the dais. Sir is a gold medalist in his postgraduate examination. He has previously worked as assistant professor at Uspana Medical College, currently associate professor, Department of Pulmonary Medicine at NIMS. His topics of interest are allergic disorders, diffuse lung diseases, and intervention pulmonology. I would now like to request them to introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, I have made that at the outset for inviting me and making me participate in this lovely program. Uh, since morning we have been combating with various mubabs, marizubab, 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 all these things. Because we are heading to a precision therapy. Now the treatment of asthma is very much individualized. So as we all know, there are two types of inflammation, TS2 and TS0. So in TS2 asthma, we have various modalities like MAP therapies. Coming to TS0 or low TS2 type of inflammation, we have very few options. In that, we have uh, what is called branchial thermoplasty. So for that, uh, which, we have, which has been started by Dr. Navarjuna, a couple of years ago, he is the first person to start with, and we have more number of any other center. So, we are now going to hear about branchial thermoplasty by Dr. Nagarjuna. Before talking to the topic proper, I ask my co chair to introduce the speaker to the audience. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, so, I think uh, he doesn't require any introduction, so we'll go ahead straight away with the presentation. Yeah, I think because we are running a little bit late, we just want to finish off the talks so that we can have the workstation. There is a slight change in the plan also. We thought of having a live case, but instead we will show a nice recording where the same thing will be projected because if we have a live case from the OT, which is already being done, it will take a lot of time. So, uh, thermoplasty, as you all know, uh, is the only... Uh, yeah. Only bronchoscopic procedure for asthma, but before I talk, I would also like to say I am not a pro thermoplastic person. We, we give a lot of biologics also. So it is just that because we do thermoplasty and permanent thermoplasty, we in fact use biologics more often than thermoplasty. And since the launch of mepolizumab and dendalizumab, 
our number of cases of thermoplasty has literally crashed. So we are in fact using more uh, biology than thermoplasty. So very quickly I will just talk about the mechanisms and everything. So what is thermoplasty? It's a bronchoscopic procedure. Fundamentally speaking, a radio frequency energy is uh, applied via a special catheter, I'll be, sh I'll be showing them, to the airways and then this is converted to heat and this heat supposed to ablate the smooth muscles. So when the smooth muscle, the, the, the hypertrophic smooth muscle um, decreases, the hypertrophic comes down, it is postulated that the airway opens up and the symptoms become better. So this was the initial postulation that it was basically thought to work by acting on the smooth muscles but then over the last 10 years a lot of publications have come, I won't be going each of them and the action of BT is beyond smooth muscle ablation. A lot of well done studies, uh, histopathologic studies have shown that inflammatory markets come down, inflammatory cytokine production comes down, the submucosal nerves and lead endocrine cells also get ablated as a result of which the, the tone of the bronchi and the bronchioles change. The small airway function also becomes better though the small airways are not directly targeted and there also changes in the extracellular matrix. So a lot of uh, uh, data, initially it was very few studies, AIR, AIR2 and VISA but then over the years a lot of studies have come. The three landmark trials which have been done, AIR2 is a sham control, AIR and VISA uh, uh, did not have a sham control. They included patients with moderate to severe asthma with a even of more than 50 to 60 percent. All of them, what did they show? The quality of life improved, exacerbations came down, ER visits came down, asthma control improved. What is more important is the follow-up. So unlike biologics, BT is a one-time procedure. So you do thermoplasty three sessions spaced over three to four weeks and then people who respond tend to respond, continue being responsive. So we had five-year data published around three to four years ago and what they have shown that hospitalizations come down, emergency department visits which have come down continue to be less till five years. The severe exacerbations and OC issues also was better till 5 years and adverse events are also better. This was published, uh, presented in the last conference also but what is more important is this paper which was published only a couple of months ago is the effectiveness at 10 years. So this is 10 years follow up after the initial uh, trials. Median of, median of 12 years follow up was done for a subset of people. 136 patients of the 260 patients who were enrolled in the initial trials were followed up and also 56 control or sham patients also were followed by. What they had shown interestingly is that at the end of 10 years also, if you can look here, the hospital admissions, the hospital admissions were significantly less than the patient. So the effect of BP persists till 10 years in those who are responding. At the, Emergency department visits also was less than the baseline, though after five years some people started having exacerbations. The quality of life remained better till 10 years, the asthma control also improved till 10 years. So this is a very interesting paper, in fact we don't have 10 years uh, follow up even for biologics. For Mepoli, Vendrali, Omali we have 5 years, for Omali we have I think 7 to 9 years also, but for BPM we have 10 years follow up. Severe asthma exacerbations also as compared to the baseline were lesser, but after 5 years we do see that some patients are starting to have exacerbations. Again very important, a lot of concern about the long term safety of the thermoplasty which was addressed in this BT10 study. Around 100 patients underwent the CT at the end of 10 years. What they have shown is 7 cases of the 100 developed bronchitis which was not there earlier. But all of them were clinically silent, 7 were radiologically classified as mild and 1 had moderate and no one developed bronchosteosis. So what they had said is that the safety profile is acceptable. Uh, now, uh, all the clinical trials, all the RCTs have focused on FE1 of more than 50. But there are a lot of case series where it has been shown that even in FE1, 30 to 60 percent, it is beneficial, it can be safely done. Now, the problem with thermoplasty is unlike biologics, we don't have a eligibility criteria. So, you don't, you cannot choose a person based upon one investigation. So this has been a point of huge debate, research and a lot of studies which are coming on thermoplasty looking at trying to identify a responder. So how do you define a responder? In the BT10 plus study it was defined as participant with no exacerbation, no severe exacerbation or admission after BT and he should not be a oral corticosteroids or monoclonal antibodies. So this is when you call a person as a BT responder. As per this definition, 70% of the original air air to visa trial participants were responders even at 10 years. 
So which is a very good response I would say as far as BT is concerned. Then predictors of response, younger people seem to respond better, 76 versus 61. Higher activations, more than 40 versus less than 40, again better response was seen. Fixed obstruction was better than reversal obstruction. This is the case too which was uh, being discussed also had a fixed obstruction. So fixed obstruction had better response as compared to reversal obstruction and uh, poorer quality of life had better response. This is one study. Similarly, other studies which have come up which looked at clinical and histopathological predictors of response. This is very interesting because now BP is not phenotype specific. So in the sense even in T2 high or T2 low it has been tried. So in this patient, in this, this is a state from Australia, 23 patients with refractory asthma underwent BP. The predictors of response, again younger age, just like the BP 10 plus study, younger people seem to respond better. Here interestingly all the T2 high phenotype predictors are also correlated with the response. Presence of atopy, higher blood eosinophils, higher glucose eosinophils. They postulated that one of the mechanisms of action of BP is also reduction in the mucosal inflammation. So at one year when they did the biopsy, people who had reduction in mucosal eosinophils, reduction in blood eosinophils, reduction in iron third degree levels were those who were responding. So again the whole concept of BT being only for T2 low is being challenged. BT is also coming into picture in T2 high. In fact T2 high markets are now being shown as predictors of response. This is also one RCT, early versus delayed BT. And what that shown is that though BT decreases the smooth muscle, yes, but this reduction in smooth muscle is not correlating with response. So what is correlating with response is baseline Ig levels and eosinophilia. So again, a lot of data, it's a little confusing, still we don't have an answer as to who is the correct person. But nevertheless, what these studies say is that younger age people probably respond better. Higher number of activations, there are three or four studies where they have said that higher activations respond better. It works well in both T2 and T2 high and T2 low as far as the data is uh, presented and the smooth muscle reduction does not correlate with response. So this is about uh, whatever data we have, see we don't have a fixed yes or no that if this marker is there you do BT, so we don't have such an answer and uh, selecting the correct patient whatever algorithms have been proposed are not evidence based because there is no accurate comparison, they are what the experts thought. So T2 low definitely we don't have much options other than macrolytes, weight loss and other things. For T2 high because biologics are non-invasive, they always give a uh, preferable uh, option, they, they are given, in, they, they become first in the order. If the person does not respond to biologics, cannot afford biologics, does not want biologics or does not tolerate biologic, then the role of BT is there in T2 high. This is what the algorithm says as of now. So what do we follow? We follow sort of international water, whatever is followed, age 18 to 65 years, presence of obstruction, more than 30 we do, at even of less than 30 we are still scared to do thermoplasty. Reversibility may or may not be present. They should be on three controllers and despite being on three controllers, the quality of life and asthma control should be uh, not good, there is a poor quality of life and then obviously the person should be in a stable phase, so no exacerbation or infection in the preceding two weeks. So because we are not having a live case without we will be doing a live case because of paucity of time, we will, I just briefly tell, this is how it is, a catheter, uh, this is how a BT catheter is, a small catheter with four arms, in the workstation also we can show this uh, BT catheter and this is the RF controller which, which the catheter is attached to the uh, uh, RF controller and it is passed through a bronchoscopic working channel. This will be demonstrated in the works. Immediate post-procedure exacerbation. So post-thermoplasty, a subset of them can have mild exacerbation. So as to prevent the exacerbation, we should do, we should give them oral corticosteroids starting from three days prior to procedure, on the day of procedure and one to two days after the procedure. And we should ensure that the person is stable with no infection and a formal TAC should be done. On the day of procedure, we get nebulized medicines, IV hydrocortisone. The bronchoscope size, again as I have said, more activations, better response. So smaller the scope, the more deeper you can go. And if you use a P190, which has a, a 4.2 mm outer diameter, we can reach a much distal into the airway and then we can have more access and more activation. So there is no ideal bronchoscope size you can do with an adult or a thin scope but then we normally use a P190 scope for thermoplasty. We do it in general anesthesia using a major in OT and we usually advance the catheter. This is uh, no, 
till we find resistance and then I'll just show one small video down the way. We need to have three or four people, one operator, one to be catheter operator, one person to track the segments so that we don't redo a segment or we don't miss a segment. One nurse should be there and one anesthetist. So five people are required then we do the procedure. Uh, three three sittings, first, uh, first sitting is the right lower lobe, second is the left lower lobe, third is the both upper lobes. Three to four, three to four weeks should be the ideal gap between each session. This is a, a, a chart which is given by the company also. This is just to make sure that we track each segment and we don't miss any segment when we do the procedure. So how do we do? I think we just play the video with you. Can you play the video for me? Huh. So this is one of the segments. You can see the BT catheter has been advanced till the end. The audio. This has an audio also. So what we do is we go distally, open the flanges, activate. Each activation takes 10 seconds. And after that, again the catheter is closed. It is pulled back by 5 millimeters. Again inflated, again activated. So every 5 minutes, every 5 millimeters the activation is done. So the whole length of airway is basically activated. If you can see here, after every activation, the, the catheter is being pulled back approximately by 5 millimeters. Each black mark is 5 millimeters. And then again the activation is done. You know, as we come proximally, we can see the the uh, the BT flanges. You know, you can see once you open the catheter, this is the operator. So we have an operator who will be opening the flanges. And once the flanges are open, the flanges will come in contact with the, the bronchus wall. As we start pulling back many times, what we see now that one segment is over, we come back, we go into the other segment. So this way each and every segment is activated. So post-procedure care, nebulizers, stop of hydrocortisone, we do it as a daycare procedure. Sometimes we admit the person, but not routinely. If the person has an exacerbation, we admit the person. I think this is all about the BT, I won't take much time. So very, some practical considerations, every time we are faced with a problem, should we do biologics or should we do thermoplasty? So definitely biologics are non-invasive, but then both the options are offered to the patient. There are some clear-cut uh, uh, scenarios where biologics are better than thermoplasty, cannot, for BT cannot be done. Age less than 18 years, age more than 65, thermoplasty is a higher risk. Low IP1, multiple comorbidities, again because BT is a bronchoscopic procedure requiring sedation anesthesia, Biologics are preferred over thermoplasty. Uh, where thermoplasty scores over biology is that there is no need for long term repetitive therapies. It is just one, one uh, sitting, uh, three sittings done over two months. And then if the person is a responder, he will continue to be a, be a responder. Cost effectiveness. In the long term, BT will be more cost effective than biologic. So in the short term, biologics are better. But if you look at the long term cost, biologics are very costly. T2 low phenotype, biologics cannot be used, so the only option we have is BT. And remote areas of residence, where people coming from very far away places where biologics cannot be delivered or it will become difficult for a person to come. So, this is one practical uh, a, a point when thermoplasty might score over. So, this is not a comparison, this is just points where one scores over the other. So, just to conclude, thermoplasty is a promising option. For very select patients, benefits as with biologic symptoms are better, quality of is better, reduce OCS, reduce exacerbations, and reduces the reliever use. So, however, further studies are required to determine who will benefit the most. And uh, long term safety, as I have said, is not documented. We have 10 years follow up also. I think with this, I will just end my talk and hope I was clear. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. How many BTs have you done so far? And what is, have you kept a detailed record of all these yeah. cases? That will be presented by Dr. Prati. So we have both our data and also we have compiled Indian data. The four centers collaborated and compiled that will be presented. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, can we expect any uh, guidance from the future uh, ongoing investigative methods like OCT, opticals, coherence, tomography, where we can assess the area wall smooth muscle? I do accept that smooth, smooth muscle mass is not going to be translated into the clinical benefit, but still, will it be acting as a guide in future so that we can map and subject them to the 
I think there is only one target study on this thing, not on OCT, but I think polarized MRI. Yes, they, they use something called a polarized uh, MRI. OCT is there and CLD is there. Uh, Transfocal no, laser microscope. For assessing response to BT. I'm not gotcha. sure. Okay. Gotcha. So, this one study where they look at, they look at big segments were narrowed, only that segment they have done. So, there is some work going on, but as of now, we don't have any concrete answers. What do you do with uh, asthma, COPD, or that? For fixed obstruction also thermoplastic can be offered for remodeled asthma. In fact, fixed obstruction is said to fare better as compared to reversible obstruction in the BT10 plus. Biologics also can be offered. It's not that you have to have a reversible leg obstruction for biologics. Because many of our long-standing asthma, though they are implemented, they lose their reversibility. It doesn't mean that they were not asthmatic, they are only COPDs. They are just remote asthma or ICOS, whatever. Sir, any the FP is very much established after any trials going involving even middle low mass. That is also there. Now, people have started doing middle low mass. See, people have started doing middle low mass. That publication is also there. Again, because of positive effect, they were not there. A very, very valid point. Earlier, middle low was not there because of fear of RML stenosis. You see the narrowest segment. But now that stenosis is not a complication, people have started doing right middle low also. But whether doing adding right middle low will actually translate to clinical benefit, I don't think has been proven. But safety of doing right RML VT uh, has been taken. Sir, uh, we are offering it to any patients, so sir. Uh, is there uh, any any cases we have developed that is strip to pattern? I, uh, we are treating the obstructive pattern now because I mean, we are ablating the smooth no, muscles. I think that I have shown a lot of. A lot of work which happened on safety of BT, a lot of papers which have come on looking at the bronchial tesis restriction. Focal transient bronchial atesia has been described and, and, and as I have said in the BT test, seven people developed a clinically insignificant bronchial tesis. That is the only thing. Uh, one last question, sir, from practice point of view. Uh, does insurance cover BT? <laughs> it depends on the luck of the person and the mood of the insurance agent. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, and I would like to conclude this session on behalf of the chair. Okay, this one, one small talk on uh, the experience, five minutes, five minutes. Can you present in the experience, the, the, our experience and then the cost, cost of the Cost, the cathedral is 1.8 lakhs. So that, that is the cost of the cathedral. In, in, at the, the company's recommendation is you have to use three different cathedrals for three different sittings. But, to the best I know, all the centers who are doing VT in India are using the same catheter in three settings and I can tell also that it works. That the catheter works in second sitting and third setting also. But sometimes what happens if you go very angulated segments, the catheter can get a little thinned. If, if that is the case, you have to use a new catheter. So you should be gentle in using the catheter. If you are gentle, the, 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 the catheter will work for all the three sessions also. Good afternoon and all. I am presenting our data from our center. Uh, so this is our team performing the procedure in our OT. Uh, we procured the equipment in March 2018. As of today, we have initiated 20 patients and completed 58 sessions. Uh, we have the good fortune of performing the highest number of bronchial thermoplasties in this country. Uh, briefly, this is a clinical profile of our patients. Uh, I will just directly go to the summary slide to save time. Uh, the age ranged from 30 to 67 years. The mean FEV1 was 60.75. However, nearly a one fourth of our one third of our patients had FEV1 of less than 50%. Uh, this is uh, these type of patients were never enrolled in the large trials. That is the AR1 and the RISA trials and AR1, AR2 and the RISA trials. Uh, 30 of our 20 patients had T2 high asthma, while seven had T2 low asthma. The mean number of exacerbations per year was 4.6 and 
and five patients required serious uh, had serious exacerbations requiring ICU care. As for Gina, 14 of our 20 patients were uncontrolled. Uh, 17 had a low ACT that is less than 19, and 18 had a poor ACQ score that is more than 1.5. All our 20 cases were on high dose ICS, LABA, and Montelukast. Four of them were on maintenance OCS therapy and seven were receiving LAMA. So as, as Sir has described, we do, this, uh, we do it in three sessions. The first session is the right lower lobe, the second is the left lower lobe and the third session is both the upper lobes. Uh, on an average, we have, we have done 73 activations in the right lower lobe, uh, 65 in the left lower lobe and 88 in both upper lobes. So that, that is a total of 410 activations on an average per patient. Uh, we have had very minor complications in very few patients, mild intraprocedural bleeding in three sessions and intraprocedural intra hypoxemia in one case. Uh, three patients required hospitalization post-procedure due to an exacerbation post-BT. The results of BT, as you can see in this chart, uh, most of our patients showed an improvement in the ACT score post-procedure. However, in few of them, as time progressed, their symptoms tend to worsen. However, some of them had sustained improvement in symptoms despite one and a half year of follow-up. They also showed improvement in quality of life. Uh, almost all patients showed immediate improvement and improvement in quality of life was more sustained as compared to improvement in symptoms. Uh, exacerbation post-procedure, uh, there was significant reduction in both the number of exacerbations and the number of serious exacerbations post-procedure. As you can see from this graph, almost all patients had lower exacerbation rate post-procedure and all but one patients did not require hospitalization in the year following BT. The lung function post-thermoplasty tended to remain the same or showed very marginal improvement. In our cases, uh, 13 cases showed uh, stable lung function, whereas improvement was seen in two patients. However, none of them showed any decline in lung function post-procedure. Uh, as Sir described BT responders, the definition used is no exacerbation requiring admission, a 50% decrease in the frequency of severe exacerbations needing OCS, and improvement in asthma control in subsequent one year. From our cohort of 20 cases, 16 were BT responders, however, 4 failed to show any significant response, 2 of which have been initiated on mepolizumab and 1 on Benrali. As a routine, we do endobronchial biopsies before the first session and after the third session from the, from the left lower lobe to assess the histopathological changes. And in our cases, we have seen majorly 3 changes post-procedure. First one, the decrease in smooth muscle mass. Second is the decrease in the mucosal goblet cells and the submucosal inflammation. And they show mild increase in fibrosis post-procedure. Now I will come into the Indian experience. Uh, this is, is a retrospective study from four centers including ours. 36 patients were enrolled. A total of 105 sessions were performed. As you can see, the characteristics are very similar to ours except that the age range was slightly wider. Uh, FAV1 also again, they, they included several patients with FAV1 less than 50%. The mean exacerbations was 3.5 per year. Almost all patients uh, had uncontrolled as per GINA. All the patients were on high dose ICS, LABA and Montelukast. 8 patients were on maintenance OCS therapy, 24 on LAMA and 4 were on, four were on omalizumab treatment. The procedure is performed under general anesthesia, mostly using a laryngeal mask airway. Usually a 4.2 mm bronchoscope is used. Uh, the intraprocedural complications were seen only in 6.7% of the sessions and exacerbation post-procedure was seen in 5.7% of the patients. The results as per our data showed significant improvement in the ACT score, ACQ score and AQLQ score that is, they showed improvement in control and in quality of life. The exacerbations per year significantly reduced from 3 pre-procedure to 0.5 post-procedure. The FEV1 continued to remain stable post-procedure with no significant improvement or decline. 
To summarize, bronchial thermoplasty is a promising option in patients with refractory asthma. Uh, as per our experience and the Indian experience, it shows improvement in quality of life, improves asthma control, yeah, causes a significant reduction in exacerbation, and the lung function remains stable post procedure. It has demonstrated to be a safe procedure even in, pe even in people with FEV1 less than 60% with very few complications intra and post op. Thank you. Of your questions are yes, sir. Uh, of the 13, 6 had previously received biologics, sir. They failed to show response. That is when we went ahead with BT. The other patients, we gave them both the options, and due to financial reasons and repeated hospital, yeah. they opted for BT. The other reason was, sir, that most of these cases were before the polling that many were actually yeah. initiated for the launch. The polling was initiated in 2019, and we had duty from I think 2018. So, majority of uh, the eosinophilic cases were not fulfilling criteria for Ohali before the polling so was launched. So ended up having only BT as the option. That is one reason why we have a, a higher the number of T2Y. So as I had said, since Napoli and Bengali had come into the market, I think in the last... Ongoing, huh? So this, the Indian data is said, accepted for publication in Lung India. So this, this is the data they have taken concern. Even one of the participating centers, it is accepted. I don't know when it will be published. That is an excellent uh, job by Captain Art in this team. Can you just uh, flash the historical slide? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I thought I saw a lot of adipostition there. Was, no, there is no adipostition. I don't know. I think you have a gland switch. Fat cells? Complex cells. Those are complex cells. That's not adipostition. Okay. This is a direction of smooth muscle mass, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is that adipostition? This is the goblet cells. Okay. Yeah, they have the goblet cells. Definite reduction in number and size of goblet cells. Dr. Narachina and his team requires a big round of applause by taking back and some of us in a big way. It is then first center to have such a great number of branches of With that, we wrap up this branch of thermoplasty session. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would require Vishnu Rao sir to come on the stage to present mementos to our chairpersons. And Dr. Ganadhar Reddy sir, please. Dr. Bhaskar sir, Now moving on to the last session of the day before we head to the workstations. Uh, it is on setting up of severe asthma clinics. I would like to invite the chairpersons to uh, for this session. Dr. C. N. Prasad sir, Dr. G. Avinash, Dr. J. Raghunath Reddy and Dr. N. Nalini. Dr. C. N. Prasad sir is a professor of Department of Respiratory Medicine at Pratima Institute of Medical Sciences, Karimnagar. 
uh, Dr. G. Avinash is a consultant pulmonologist at King's Hospital, Sikandrabad. Uh, he has vast experience in pulmonology and specializes in bronchoscopic interventions. Dr. J. Raghunath Reddy is a consultant pulmonologist, critical care and sleep medicine at Sunshine Hospital, Sikandrabad. He has fellowship in critical care medicine from Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences. I would request the chairpersons to call upon the speakers for this session. In this, uh, the speaker doesn't need any introduction actually. It is uh, Dr. Deepak Talwar. He is a director and chair in pulmonology, uh, sleep, critical care medicine, Metro Institute of Health Sciences, Noida. And uh, he is a fellow American College of Chest Physicians and uh, uh, National College of Chest Physicians. And uh, he is fellow in many associations. And uh, he is a teacher par excellence. He doesn't need any further introduction. And it's my pleasure that I am introducing him. Since your Talwar sir is not here, we have a recorded talk which we will be playing. Look, I am going to talk now about setting up our first severe asthma clinic in India and the experience and how we went about and uh, what are the things which are the challenges here. And uh, thank you, uh, Naveen. <laughs> Hello, I am going to talk now about setting up our first severe asthma clinic in India and the experience and how we went about and uh, what are the things which were the challenges here. And uh, thank you, uh, Navajan, for calling me for this topic also. And uh, since you have started this, we started it in Bay back in 2017. And the need for this was primarily required because we had a Valizumab for almost 10 years prior to that. But we had a coming up of the bronchial thermoplasty at that point of time. And we also knew that the anti il files are coming. And we will require a specific clinic where uh, you know we need to have a time and offer comprehensive management to these patients using their multidisciplinary teams and create an opportunity for research, education and training. The first hurdle was how are we going to get the patient. So reference from self OPD, other pulmonologists and internists was envisaged but the bulk of patients came from our own respiratory OPD. Self referral started coming over a period of time and uh, we also targeted most of those patients who were admitted with acute exacerbations of asthma. And uh, that is the one one place which we know that uh, these exacerbations can be reduced uh, by effective management in severe asthma clinic. So they were also rooted into this clinic. So severe asthma clinic is actually a specialty clinic, but it is a disease specific, and it is definitely different from a routine asthma clinic because it requires a lot of systematic approach to diagnose and manage only severe asthma. So not a routine of male patients of asthma do come here. And the idea of doing this clinic is because you want to have a different path to be given to these patients in their journey where they keep on suffering with severe asthma and you would like to make it totally different. Just about 4-5% to of patients of asthma will qualify for severe asthma clinic uh, visits and these are the group of patients where we would be devoting most of our time. And uh, the very important aspect is that uh, these patients will require a lot of time not only from the approach and the multidisciplinary team which requires to look into these patients, uh, more than 90% of them will have only difficult to control asthma. Once we do all these things like I discussed in my phenotyping also, that ultimately the right patient selection is the key driver for the success of therapies which are available for severe asthma. And this requires a lot of time, education and support, not only of the patients but also of their caregivers to inculcate the compliance to biologics in these patients. It's an evolving science and we need to update ourselves very, very frequently. As we have seen that we started with one biologic, we have two, we have got now three, and next year probably we'll be having four biologics to use it. The first question which comes is how often you need to run. And generally if you have 20 new cases even visiting you once in a year, you can actually run a severe asthma clinic. Uh, we had uh, a rough estimate of 10 new cases coming every week to our respiratory OPDs. So we decided to run half a day every week 
and spent about three to four hours. But soon we realized within two to three months that we need to run it on the entire day. So one complete day, that is a Tuesday, is being given to the severe asthma clinic. This is a high-end clinic which is offering the top of the line treatment and of course it will require a lot of time. So the second question which comes is that who are the patients who should be entertained in severe asthma clinic? All patients who are on Gina step 5. So we are generally in the west they take step 4, 5 but uh, considering that we will be offering the phenotyping and the uh, phenotyping based treatment to these patients, we will be only considering Gina step 5 patients. So we call them irrespective of their control to confirm the diagnosis and do all the steps like compliance, technique, they are looking for the asthma triggers and addressing their comorbidities and seeing that we have exhausted all available treatment uh, for Gina step 5 uh, except for oral corticosteroids or even if the patients are on oral corticosteroids they are also considered because the aim would be to take them off oral corticosteroids because we do not want to have potential side effects of the therapies which are being used in these patients. So at the end of course these patients will be considered for personalized therapies which are not only um, uh, biologics but also bronchial thermoplasty and when we started the clinic we had only two options either to give them omalizumab or those who fail on omalizumab or those who cannot take omalizumab like two low asthmas bronchial thermoplasty. The infrastructure with which we started were two pulmonologists, medical residents, patient counseling, respiratory therapist and allergologists because they were all available in the department itself. The diagnostic facilities did not require much of the additions because lung function, laboratory, allergy tests, immunocaps, exhaled breath nitric oxide and imaging studies for the upper and lower airways were all available in the hospital. However, we did require extra recording systems like protocols, demographic and clinical data entering as well as patients uh, asthma control tests and a lot of educated material and we need to have this research data all uh, being in an uh, archival system where this patient's data can be archived at any point of time and at every visit. We also required a place to administer medications and perform interventions like giving them biologics and immunotherapy which was already available and a bronchoscopy suit for bronchial thermoplasty which was also available and we had started bronchial thermoplasty at that point of time. But we also required an MDT where the referrals to ENT, gastroenterologists, dietitians, psychologists and speech therapists were required in a couple of patients and we used them. And of course sleep studies and advanced lung functions were also on board available to us at the time when we started our severe asthma clinic. This is the kind of protocols which we made. It was initially 36 pages, then it was reduced to 24 and then finally to 10 pages because over a period of time we realized what is essential and what is not essential and we also tried to reduce the data so that the time taken to fill up these forms is also reduced. Generally it takes about 2 hours and now it takes about 1 hour to complete evaluation of a patient of severe asthma. The flow dynamics of this, uh, the patients in the severe asthma clinic have been like this. The patient comes, is being seen by our residents and counselors. The files are made, performers are filled, their uh, vitals and reasons for referral are done. All these checks for the difficult to control asthma are done through the detailed history and examinations and baseline investigations which include lung functions, imaging, blood tests and exhaled retrocancer are all done. Once that is all done, the cases are presented and discussed with the fellows and consultants where we identify the difficult to control asthma features, optimize their therapies, identify the targetable traits and then have an action plan which is put into place for three months and the, at three months these patients are re-evaluated for you know, phenotyping as well as the further offer for giving them biologics or bronchial thermoplasty. Generally, after starting these patients from the severe asthma, every 6 weeks to 12 weeks they are reviewed and if they become he healthy and, uh, uh, and the asthma gets controlled, they are being shifted back to their routine respiratory OPDs, otherwise they continue to be the part of severe asthma clinic. Very important aspect is to provide them helpline 24 into 7. So generally the counselor's numbers are given as well as the resident who can take care of their uh, immediate uh, problems if they arise during their uh, management uh, of severe asthma from the clinic side. And then finally these patients were phenotyped and as I've already said we take blood eosinophils more than 300, phenol more than 20 and uh, also we take a lot of clinical features where we decide whether this patient is type 2 inflammation being driven by IgE or by eosinophils and uh, on the basis of this the phenotyping in our severe asthma clinic showed that uh, 
purely uh, uh, eosinophilic asthma is 20 percent, uh, purely IgE or allergic uh, asthma is 36 percent, type 2 low asthma is 15 percent and a significant number of more than one third patients is actually nearly one third patients are actually the overlap group. So after the phenotyping, it's the eligibility criteria, so we look for that and we have omalizumab, mepolizumab and benalizumab and we have a data of uh, nearly about 300 patients on omalizumab, 60 patients on mepolizumab and 8 patients on benalizumab and 7 patients who have undergone bronchial thermoplasty in the last uh, 3 years. So the key messages from the inputs from a severe asthma clinic uh, in India is that uh, it does require an expert pulmonologist with a vision to develop good and clinical practice in this therapeutic area and uh, definitely Dr. Nagarjuna is one of them who has taken the strides to start this clinic. It clinic also incorporates the multidisciplinary approach for optimal utilization of various personnel. Sometimes the the the, uh, the workers which we are using are, are changing their uh, you know roles by doing counseling as well as looking at their inhaler uh, techniques and uh, filling up the data and other things. Structured protocols are must and they must be with the checklist so that it can be easily filled and it should be as uh, less time consuming as possible and the clinic will evolve over a period of time. We have seen that so many things have changed in the last three to four years that we have been able to incorporate them. So it's like an evolving kind of a, a situation where you need to uh, incorporate a lot of things and perhaps drop a few of things to make it more smart and more friendly to the patients as well as to the caregivers and healthcare uh, providers. And uh, very importantly, what we learned in our asthma, severe asthma service program is that it gave a lot of training and research opportunities to the uh, young uh, uh, graduating pulmonologists as well as to our other faculty and the other uh, pulmonologists across India. A good communication, print and media exposure also yields a good results in running this clinic successfully. But peer groups are equally important to help and propagate it further and you all are the part of it. With that, I would like to thank you all and uh, thank you Anadarjuna for having me for this wonderful program. Hello, I am going to talk now. It's a wonderful talk from by Dr. Deepak Tarwar, sir. So, okay, so I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Nagarjuna Mataru. So, no need of any introduction, I take the pleasure in introducing him. He is the uh, Organizing Secretary of Severe Asthma Summit, Senior Consultant at uh, Vishwada Hospital Somaji Guda, Clinical Inter Interventional Pulmonologist. And uh, he's the one who did the first bronchial thermoplasty procedure in Telugu states. First, to introduce bronchoscopic cryotherapy in Telangana. He has 35 original research articles on his name. And he is the author of various textbooks in pulmonary medicine. Thank you, Andre. So, I think I just need very quick because I think Dr. Tanzar said covered most of the things. Uh, severe asthma clinics is something which we wanted to start for almost like two years from now, but because of COVID, it was perpetually getting delayed. The first pandemic came, second, second epidemic came. So uh, I think a uh, huge thanks to our company help also AstraZeneca and GSK have been really helpful in setting up our severe asthma clinic. The problems as Dr. Kalbasar had said were in routine, busy OPD, you don't get time to actually take a detailed history. So uh, I think the this was where we felt that there was a need for a, a structured protocol and everything and we soft launched this last month with, with these highlights that we wanted to have a structured comprehensive approach where the person can get access to everything as far as severe asthma is considered one, one roof and to try to move on to precision therapy. As Dr. Talwar again has already said, the first thing is to have a performer. Most of the things we already have, it is not very difficult to set up or start a severe asthma clinic. You already have everything. It is just that you have to streamline them and then plan a bit better to have to start it. So the most important thing was to have a performer. So we, we created a 10 page performer which is different from what is being used in North India which we thought was relevant for our people and then we started using this. Second important thing is to have the manpower. It is not possible for you to do everything. So now we have physician assistants, we have good doctors who help us 
and we also train counselors. Again, at, here uh, our AstraZeneca team also has helped us to get a trained counselor who does burden of, uh, of the job. He talks to the person, he counsels the person, he checks the inhaler technique and he also helps in filling up the book. And the third thing is to have ex uh, region specific education material which also we have created so that it creates awareness to the patients also. Once everything is done, we started the clinic, it is different because it is a specific day. This is how the patients flow, bulk of it has been said, patients get referred. At this point of time, most of them are self-referred. So people have already under our follow-up is starting to see them in the severe asthma clinic. Some people by word of mouth are coming for the severe asthma clinic. Once they are done, they are, they are given a unique number, registration number. The first thing is they go to the asthma counsellor who fills the performa, who fills the quality of life score. Otherwise, you, in a busy OPD, you won't get time to do all these things. So all of it is done by the counsellor. Technique is uh, taught. He gives the number and becomes the point of contact uh, to the patient after he goes back from the OPD. Then he goes to the resident doctors, associate doctors who detailedly assess. As, he, as he has been said, it takes 45 minutes to one hour to fill the performa in detail. have started data archiving, excel sheets are made, they are all entered. At this point of time, we don't have, uh, we are only around I think 40-50 uh, patients enrolled in the Sivrasana clinic in the last one month and once it crosses 100, we plan to analyze our own data. Practical difficulties, it is not very, it is a lot of practical problems. Getting the correct patients referred, many times people who come for severe asthma are not actually asthmatics. Getting the patients to come on one particular day is again problematic. Ensuring enough time is spent. For this, we need to have manpower. And many times, what we see, they, we feel a treatment is better, but the patient cannot afford the treatment. Uh, so, we also have several research projects ongoing at our asthma clinic right now. Five trials on various uh, biologics. We can uh, uh, enroll the patient if they fulfill the criteria. Because of these trials, many people who otherwise cannot afford a biologic are being given biologics for six months to 12 months and then they are improving. Initial experience, 42 patients in the last one, one month to 40 days, mean age 53 years, predominantly women, all the majority overweight or obese. Of these 42 patients, we, 19 patients, 19% of them were initial from biologics, 2 on omali, 4 on mercury, 2 on ventrally, and 1 patient on thermoplasty. I think this is a very, very initial experience, but then what I would want to say is that Sivir Asthma Clinic is now, it's not very difficult to start an asthma clinic, I think, and it would definitely change the way a person is managed, because once a detailed, structured assessment is made many times, we ourselves are realizing that the same person has been under our follow-up for the last one year, but once the structured performance is there, some three or four points which we have missed are identified. So I think it definitely improves the person's asthma control, it's need of the hour, and time to have disease specific specialists, I think people should start taking one disease as their uh, uh, specialization and then move forward. And then uh, that's it. So this is about, uh, very briefly about our ex initial experience with severe asthma. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. May I now call upon uh, Paramjyoti, sir, to come on to the dais to present mementos to our uh, chairpersons. Dr. C. N. Prasad, sir. Dr. Avinash, sir. Uh, 
Thank you, sir. Uh, with this, we come to the end of today's presentations. We all will head towards the workstations now uh, after the quiz answers. I think we have come to the fag end of the meeting. Many people have left, but then people who are there, uh, I think uh, there are two, two, two important things which I left. One is uh, the PG quiz uh, results. Uh, one. Before I give the results, I also tell the answers to the questions. Can you put the answers uh, slide? Answers So before I say the answer, I think it is taking some time. I would request uh, again uh, Dr. Paramsa to give the prizes to the, the winners. Uh, the first prize goes to answers again in this. I think two minutes before I tell the this, the, the, uh, this ends. the first question was this: uh, Are these statements true or false? All severe asthmatics are uncontrolled, and all uncontrolled asthma is a severe. I think the answer to both of them is both are false. It is important uh, for all the PGs to know that uh, severe asthma need not be uncontrolled. It might be controlled on OCS, but then that doesn't mean that it is not severe. Severe asthma, which is controlled on OCS. Similarly, a person who is uncontrolled just because he is not an optimal dose of medicines won't qualify for severe asthma. So the answer to both of them is false. So this one, TGs are there or not there? Some of them are there. I think this is fleeting opacity. So when a person with asthma has fleeting opacity, the diagnosis is ABPA, and uh, we get the diagnosis by IgA and specific IgA levels. Inspiratory flow rates needed for inhalers for beta actuated NDA at 30 liters per minute for the one which we have, and for DPAs for double air it is around 60 for to have a good drug delivery. Uh, this is omalizumab. How does it have the following benefits? Persistence of benefit after discontinuing medicine is because they down regulate the FCR1 receptors. So it takes time for the receptors again to be expressed on the cell, and this is the reason why for some, for some months or years after the omalizumab is stopped. The effect is still there. And then the antiviral mechanism, as I have said, Omanizumab also has antiviral actions. That, that is because it actually upregulates uh, up the interferon alpha production. And this is in fact used to prevent seasonal attacks on, in children in, uh, in several countries. Here, I think the ABPA B, it is case B, and severe asthma with fungal sensitization, it is case C. Because you see, it, in both case B and C, they are sensitized to aspirulus fumigators. In case C, we don't have elevated Ig levels and asthma is severe. So this is ABPAB and this case C is SAFS. Uh, this was spoken by Dr. Disha. When interpreting the impulse oscillometer report, all of the following indices are for measuring area obstruction except I think it's R20. Okay. Uh, this, this is an wheezing lady with cysts. So the diagnosis is LAM. So LAM sometimes can present as wheezing and can be misdiagnosed as asthma. They can have hemophysis, pneumothorax, chylothoraxis. Genes, it can be sporadic or TSC mediated. So it is the TSC LAM. Uh, biology, the only biology which is approved between 6 and 12 years is omalizumab. My poly is about 12 years, BT is about 18 years. When the eosinophil point is 240, 150 to 300, it will fulfill the criteria for mepoli. If it is more than 300, it, they can be uh, given both mepoli or uh, bendalizumab. So when it is 240, that is 150 to 300, he won't qualify the eligibility criteria for bendali. So the answer is mepoli. So it is Amalia and mepoli here. This is typical high attenuating mucus. The more important thing is how to define. This is typically defined as attenuation more than this paraspinal soft tissue muscle in a non-contrast scan, typically which of more than 70. Clinical diagnostics of an eosinophilic driven asthma is presence of nasal polyps, adult onset asthma, frequent exacerbation, and OCS dependence. I think many people have answered this. Again, one on oscillometry, which of the following is true? Uh, here, I think the answer is reactants, values are frequency dependent. This I also was not aware before the talk, and many students have got this answer correct. Which means that uh, Dr. Nisha had driven home the message on impulse oscillometry. Uh, what is smart therapy? Smart means single agent for maintenance and reliever. But what is smart inhaler? Smart inhalers are different. Smart inhalers are those which you can connect.
to a mobile via Bluetooth and they give feedback about the technique and the complaints. Those are the smart, smart inhibitors. We have the loop pins. I think Adhero is the device which is there. So that is called the smart inhaler. So smart therapy is different from smart inhaler. And this is a case of relapsing polyponatis. This was discussed briefly in the first case also. Sparing of posterior wall because there is no cartilage in it. Again, this I have spoken, BT actually has an effect on small airway, simple tosylometry and all have been done and we shown that BT though doesn't directly uh, heat the small airways, there is improvement in small airway function after BT. Similarly, right middle lobe which is not typically uh, uh, activated also has decrease in smooth muscle. The reason for this is still unclear, probably because of decrease in inflammatory mediators or decrease in the nerve activation overall. New biologics, anti-TSLP biologic is tezipilumab and anti-IL4, IL-13 is dupilumab. I think dupilumab many people have written, tezipilumab no, or pilumab. I think people have written some of them. I think this is, uh, this is about the questions and they are not coming to answers. Perhaps they have come, request to come on the stage. And the first prize is goes to Dr. G. S. S. Vini. I think she is from Yeshoda Second Rabbit. Congratulations, I think you should applaud. She has got 9 out of 15 questions correct, this is a very good number. The second uh, prize goes to Dr. D. Meghna from Kamini Academy of Medical Sciences, LB Nagar, second year. Is she there? I mean, a huge applause for them. They are very close. She was eight and a half. So it's basically half, half point difference between them. Actually, we had two people who got eight and a half. We had to use the tiebreaker question to, to, to decide who's the winner. So I think with this, we, we will end the CME part of it. Though we are running, I think, one hour late. 3.15 was supposed to be the workstation. We are one hour late. So, uh, before we head to the workstations, a couple of uh, things I'd also like to, first of all, thank the, in, the national faculty uh, who came in, in person from places out of Hyderabad. I think a um, huge thanks to Dr. Sandeep Chalvi sir, Dr. Disha, Dr. Raja sir, uh, who has left because they had to catch a flight, and Dr. Balamurgan who came from Chennai, Kolkata, Pune to give their impart knowledge on various parts, a huge uh, thanks to uh, faculty and also the national faculty who made it a very lively discussion. And I uh, would also like to thank the uh, Ashoka administration for giving us the opportunity to review the blocking. A lot of uh, hard work uh, went into the uh, organizing of the conference. Our uh, marketing team, the branding team, the IT team, Everybody is there, a lot of efforts for that because it is the first physical conference after two years. Uh, it takes time to get things again back into the place, but then overall it was uh, conducted uh, very smoothly. Special thanks to a uh, uh, team headed by Makesh and Chalam for uh, doing a lot of uh, work and helping us organize this conference. Also, I'd like to thank the sponsors for the event. I think they're all there in the second floor during the workstation. Special thanks to GSK, AstraZeneca, CIPLA, Sun and the Boston and the Olympus for uh, supporting the conference and also for, uh, for handling the workstations and uh, thanks to our team. It is no, no job, is a one, one man job. We have a lot of people who are, who, are, who are with me, who are working for me. Dr. Pratik is here, Dr. Nasir, Mahindra, Shravya. Ripul, Shrikant, everyone of, of them had uh, actually put a lot of effort to get the things streamlined and despite being the festival week because the international faculty had, come, had uh, confirmed to 17th, people have actually worked together and then finally we could run the show. So with this I think we will uh, end the CME part and uh, as far as the workstations are concerned, I would request all of those who are interested to go to the second floor. Second floor we have set up six workstations, two on uh, PFTs, one on Pheno, one on Impulse Oscillometry. Again, we will request Dr. Disha and Dr. Sandeep Services because they are the only people who have uh, a deep understanding as to how these tests have to be done and interpreted. Then we have one station on thermoplasty where people can have a hand off hands on, on on a dummy model and three workstations on biologics. So the company people are there. They are, they are more than keen to demonstrate how it is done. We have videos on how it is to be administered. 
and uh, all the delegates also have uh, the the delegate badges into six, five colors with numbers written on them. So once you go to second floor, I would request people with number one to go to Feno, number two to go to oscillometry, number three to thermoplasty, number four to Omali, number five to the anti-aerial biologics. I think uh, we can have one one and a half hour there uh, looking at the various stations, and after that, I think we would uh, call it a day. Huh? Thank you so much. Thank you once again for coming to our first physical business specific uh, CMA senior asthma summit and hope that we could uh, impart uh, and disseminate some knowledge on senior asthma. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so Request all the faculty who are still there and all the delegates to just come to the front so that we can just have one photo as a memory of the Sivirath Museum. Oh.